morning. Here we are still in the middle of Lent. Lent always feels like the longest season to me, especially in the beautiful liturgy and language and music and all of the minor keys. Uh, but I encourage you to hang on. We're going to make it to Easter. Uh, this is a very special week in the life of the church. We're starting two new Bible studies, one on Tuesday morning uh, for women called Stronger at 9 o'clock. And Wednesday evening at 6.30, we're starting Disciple Fast Track. Um, thrilled about that. We'll have a free nursery. It's not too late to show up. Just show up. If you've been thinking about it, the Holy Spirit has been kind of leading you there and you've been resisting it, stop resisting. Resistance is futile, to quote the Borg. It is time for you to engage and uh, we hope that you will come and participate in Bible study and really make this Lent something very, very special. Hear now these words from the Gospel according to John chapter 19. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own home. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. You may be seated. So today we are talking about the third word in this third Sunday of Lent, and you see in this uh, moment, Mary is now being transferred to the care of Jesus' beloved disciple. Jesus is literally saying to the beloved disciple, I now want you to take care of my mother. He's saying to his mother, you now belong to this, my beloved disciple. I want to tell you something funny that always strikes me every time I read this passage. You realize that it's John writing about John. And so John is the one who's calling himself the beloved disciple. I always wonder what the other disciples would have thought of that had they read that. Like, what? what? You think mom liked you best? You know, the oldest mother's brother's routine. But John really believes that he is Jesus' beloved. And certainly in this moment, Jesus has picked him from among the others for this very crucial and very important task of caring for his mother after his death. So I thought we might start this morning by just kind of reminding ourselves about Jesus and Mary's relationship. So we're going to go through just a couple of brief scriptures that will show us how their relationship evolved. Now, for those of you who have been watching basketball all week, just think of this as the Team Mary highlight reel, okay? So let's see where Mary and Jesus were in their relationship. Of course, we remember from the book of Luke, uh, Luke 1, that we see the angel Gabriel coming to Mary to tell her that she is about to give birth to the Son of God. And this is going to happen through an immaculate conception. And of course, Mary being a young, unmarried girl, receives this news with saying that she was greatly troubled. And who wouldn't be? But by the end of the passage, we read that she has incorporated this prophecy. She has incorporated this task that God has put upon her. And her response is, let it be to me according to your word. And so even in that one brief passage, we see Mary go from a confused teenager to a, an obedient daughter of God. And the strength of her understanding and the power of her religion, because of course, remember, Mary was Jewish. And the Jews believed that a Messiah would come. And so this is now incorporating itself into her religious thinking. She knows that she is to give birth to the promised Messiah. And her response is, let it be to me according to your word. I don't know about you, but I have always envied Mary's obedience. I've always wanted to be that person that no matter what crazy thing God told me to do, like go be an ordained United Methodist minister, that I would respond with, let it be according to your word. I have to confess that I fought my calling for two years. I was not a Mary. I was, I don't know, who ran away? I was Forrest Gump. You know, I was just running. I didn't want this thing. Uh, but eventually, you know, God woos us and calls us. And eventually we all do become obedient to what we're called to do and what we're called to be. In Luke 2, we, of course, see Mary and, and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem. You know, she is great with child. They get there. There's no place for them to stay. And, of course, she gives birth to baby Jesus, and she lays him in a manger. And this beautiful section of the narrative, you know, our, our nativity passage is so well known and so familiar to all of us. And I love the part where it says that after the angels appeared in the sky and after the shepherds came to, to worship and adore and see what this thing was, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And you got to know that Mary spent all of her life pondering things in her heart and treasuring things and treasuring the, the life and the relationship that she had with her son. Mary knew Jesus better than anyone on earth. 
and Mary had that pondering in her heart. Now, this passage from the, still in Luke 2 a little later on, this is kind of a startling passage. When we tell the nativity narrative and when we teach the, the baby Jesus stories to children, we kind of overlook this, and it's startling, and it takes us right to the cross. I'm just going to read the whole passage. On the eighth day after his birth, so only eight days after Jesus was born, Jesus was presented at the temple by Joseph and Mary. While Joseph, Mary, and the infant Jesus were in the temple, a man by the name of Simeon came into the temple. He saw Jesus in Mary's arms. He walked over and took the infant Jesus out of his mother's arms. Old Simeon, with a baby Jesus in his arms, praised God, and then he blessed the couple as well as the baby. He said to Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed." and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Don't you know Mary at the foot of the cross had to be thinking about that word that was spoken to her eight days after Jesus' birth? Because surely in that moment, a sword was piercing her soul and her heart and her inner being. When we lose a child, there is a tragedy, nothing greater than that moment. And Mary lost her child. We all want to, to, to be, you know, the ones that our children bury. That's the way life should go. You know, I should live to a ripe old age of 93, and my children should come at my graveside and say, she had a great life, wasn't that great? It shouldn't be the other way. And so here's Mary at the foot of the cross with a sword piercing her soul, just as it was prophesied on the eighth day of his life. This alarming prophecy, this stunning moment, is, I'm sure, God's way of trying to prepare her for the reality of what Jesus was brought to earth to do, and yet it's still so startling. In Matthew uh, chapter 2, we see Mary and Joseph having to flee into Egypt. You remember this part of the story, that Herod has now gone through the land, and he's decided, well, I'm just going to kill all the baby boys, and I'll, you know, get this so-called Messiah, this King of the Jews, out of the way that way. And because all of the the infant baby boys were being killed, known as the slaughter of the innocents, Mary and Joseph had to flee to Egypt, where they were immigrants without papers, where they were refugees in a foreign land, and where they were cared for, and where they were allowed to come. I can't imagine what was going on in Mary's heart in that moment to have to leave her homeland and go into a foreign place and rely on strangers for the care and feeding of her family. And I also can't imagine the tragedy and the maybe even guilt that she felt that she and her baby son got to escape the terrible tragedy, knowing that other mothers were watching their children being slaughtered in Israel because Herod was out to get her son. A terrible, terrible, terrible time in our narrative. And then, you know, we come back, and we're not really sure how long they stay in Egypt. We have that wonderful little passage of uh, they go to Jerusalem for a pilgrimage. Jesus is probably around t- maybe 12. It may be kind of the bar mitzvah time of a Jewish boy's life, and he stays behind in the temple, and they're all going back home, and all of a sudden, nobody can find Jesus, and when they go back and they find him in the temple, he said, well, I'm in my father's house. You know, I meant to be about my father's business, and here again, Mary has this understanding that he really does have a heavenly father in addition to the earthly father who has been caring for him, and Mary begins in this moment to really fully understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. But I think a pivotal moment comes, and this is really my favorite Mary passage. I have preached on just this passage in the past, and it's really one of my favorite ones. The pivotal moment comes at a wonderful celebration when Mary and Jesus are attending a wedding a wedding at Cana of Galilee. And you know this story. It's a favorite story. It's a story of transformation, not just about material things, but also about our understanding of who Jesus was. And that's when Jesus turned water into wine. So you remember that what happened was they're at the wedding and all of a sudden the wine has run out. What a terrible faux pas. You know, the host must have been very upset. What do you mean the wine's run out? Oh my gosh. You know, Jewish weddings in those times lasted for days and suddenly the wine has run out. Well, Mary, sitting next to Jesus, says, the wine's run out. Like, you know, do something. And Jesus says, woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. And in that single moment of claiming who Jesus was, And being a mama, Mary turns to the servants and she says, do whatever he tells you. So she's in that 
place where she knows what he can do, and she just blows right through his objection. Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. Do whatever he tells you. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm going to push you into your destiny. I know that you're capable. Like every good helicopter mom, Mary pushes him into this moment. In fact, I think that Mary possibly was the first helicopter mom because I think she was like this. Chelsea, right there. I'm not a helicopter parent. My son wants me at his job interviews. <laughs> you see, Jesus was at a job interview. Jesus was sitting there just about ready to proclaim that he was interviewing for the position of the Savior of the world. This first miracle would be followed by many. This first transformation of something into something else was what Jesus' whole ministry and life was about, that we are to be transformed from sinners into people who follow the cross, from lonely people into people who have the abundance of community around them. Jesus is all about transformation. And so this first miracle in this first time, when Mary literally pushes him off the diving board <laughs> straight into the pool, is that pivotal moment where Mary fully understands who Jesus is and what Jesus is about and what he is meant to be. He argues at the wedding that his time has not come yet, but then at the cross, they both know deep in their hearts that indeed the time has now arrived. Because Jesus' whole birth, Jesus' whole life was always meant to end in this sacrificial death on the cross. This is what it has always been about. And Jesus and Mary understand that because God has worked through his life to prepare them both for this moment. You see, Mary was the one who completely understood the fact that Jesus was both human and divine. Of all the people around him, all of his disciples, all of his family, Mary was the only one that got it. And that's what this particular passage this morning really draws out for us, that, that co-identity of fully human and fully divine. We really see it at the cross, and we see it through Mary's eyes. She has watched the miracles happen. She has listened to the teaching. She has seen what he can do. She understands because of the immaculate conception that he indeed is fully divine, but at the cross, suffering the pain and agony of the crucifixion, he is fully human as well. I was raised in, in the United Methodist Church, and in the old kind of tradition of doing liturgy, we always said a creed every Sunday. And I've enjoyed creeds because I think creeds are a wonderful way to teach us uh, theology and to remind us of what we believe and to teach our children about what we believe. And the Nicene Creed really helps us understand our theological thinking about Jesus' divinity and humanity. So let's just say this part of the Nicene Creed together. This isn't the full creed, but this is the part of the creed that relates to Jesus. Would you read this with me? We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. And so here we are with Mary and Jesus at the cross, and he is truly, truly human. The only thing Mary could offer him in that moment was the simple comfort her of her presence she couldn't change the course she couldn't fix it she couldn't helicopter mom out of it she couldn't helicopter mom you know and and make something happen and change like we want to do for our kids to jump in and intervene and do and so all she could do in that moment was to simply be present with him so that when he looked down and saw his mother he knew he wasn't alone I think it's remarkable in that very moment that Jesus' thoughts would even be about his mother. You know, Jonathan has been talking about the agony of a crucifixion and physically what that means when someone is crucified, that it is a slow, suffocating death, that as the body sinks away from the wrist nailed to the cross, that the lungs are kind of crushed, and, and after a period of time, one can't breathe. And so even to say these words, he had to pull himself up and say, as he looked at John, here's your mother. And as he looked at his mother, here's your son. And that importance of transferring the responsibility of his mother care is a very significant moment for all of us. And the effort that it took for him even to say that 
is important for all of us. From a very practical point of view, one of the things that this teaches us is that Jesus was prepared to die. Jesus had a plan. He had thought it out. He had lived his whole life prepared to die. But even in this moment, in this practical thing, who will take care of my mother? He had made a plan and he had planned it out. On Friday, we gathered at Austin Cemetery to say goodbye to Bobby Mason. And it was a wonderful, uh, <coughs> wonderful moment. And you could tell that there had been preparation. As we work with Marie in planning everything, she had specific songs that Bobby had wanted to have sung with specific artists. She had um, two prayers that Bobby had chosen, and she had a poem that Bobby had chosen. So she and Bobby had spent time talking about his service and his funeral. And when we came to that moment, everything just flowed beautifully. And we knew that Bobby was honored and that Bobby was, was blessed because they had talked it out and they had made plans. And it went according to how Bobby wanted his funeral to go. And working with families way too many times in funeral preparations, I'm always so grateful when people have gone through that process. And when I'm dealing with the loved one that remains, that they know exactly what the other person wants for their funeral and that everything has been taken care of and everything has been prepared. And I want to say to you boldly right now, if you haven't had that conversation with your family, you need to do it tonight. You need to have a will. You need to have a living will. You need to have a DNR signed if that's your wish. You need to let people know how you want your end to be because, honey, it's coming. Death and taxes, the two things I can guarantee you in life, they're coming. And when we work with families where these conversations have been had, it's a wonderful thing for the family. It's wonderful for the church family. It's wonderful for the pastors. Then we know we are really honoring this person's wishes because they have made it clear, and I want to encourage you to get it down on paper. Amen? All of these end-of-life things need to be discussed ahead of time. We just had a recent seminar on this very issue. And if you haven't done it, if you, haven't, if you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this, go home and do it and get it on paper. Interestingly, as I came out of my car to go over to the part of the cemetery where we were having the service, I had to walk through the graveyard and I had to walk past gravestones. And I had kind of a little shock, I, I will admit to you. I had a little bit of a moment of hesitation. I was very startled because as I came around from the, kind of the back side of the cemetery and I was looking at the back of some of the gravestones, I saw this. Okay, Rad and Margie, would you raise your hand? There, there they are. So I'm walking and I see this and I just stopped dead in my tracks and I thought, oh my gosh, I've been out of the country for a, a week. Did something happen that I didn't know about? And I really had the, Rad and Margie, that's my Rad and Margie. That's Rad and Margie Tillett. Why are, where, why are they there? And, I, and then I had to think very quickly, wait a minute, no, 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 it's okay. I saw them in church on Sunday. They're... <laughs> In the immortal words of Monty Python, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and they happened to come to the funeral, and I said to them, you just gave me the fright of my life when I saw your name on a, on a tombstone. And right away, they both looked at me, and they said, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready. What a great example. Thank you. Now, I'm over my fright. It's good to see you looking so alive. <laughs> but really, that's a perfect uh, example of what we should do should do for our families to be prepared and I mean that's really prepared okay let's get rid of that screen because that's freaking me out <laughs> and the last thing that this scripture teaches us this morning is that um, it is very important for the faith community to take the responsibility of caring for one another did you notice that Jesus did not say mother Mary my brothers will take care of you your other children will take care of you. You know, Mary had other children. Mary had other boys. There were brothers involved in this. Isn't it curious that rather than charge Mary's care to the brothers, to the siblings, to the family members, Jesus chooses John the disciple. And I think that's a very, very significant thing. Unfortunately, earlier in the book of John, we read in John 7, 5, these very, very sad words. Even Jesus' brothers didn't believe. So see, they didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't believe in the, in the gospel. They didn't believe that this Messiah was the one who had come to save them. And so Jesus overrode his siblings to put Mary's care into the hands of the faith community. And I think that that really speaks to the church today, especially this week 
as we read news that, that things like Meals on Wheels may go away and may go unfunded, where will people go for help? How will people be fed if that funding goes away? You know where it's going to go. We're going to do it. We who love Jesus Christ are going to do it. We, the church, will stand in that gap for people. And unfortunately, we're probably going to have to find ourselves in, in the ministry and in the business of doing things like Meals on Wheels if that goes through. But we will do it sacrificially and we will do it gladly because Jesus calls us to care for our community. Amen? When I first came to this church in 2010, Curtis Campbell was our senior pastor and Colin Snyder was our full-time associate pastor. And I came on board as kind of a third clergy in a, at a point without pay for a period of time. And then when Colin was moved, then I stepped into that role more formally and officially. But I remember both Colin and, and Curtis as I was getting to know the church and getting to know this church's culture. The first thing that Curtis said to me was, you are so lucky to be appointed to this church because the greatest thing we have going on in this church of great ministries, and there are a lot of great ministries here, is our care ministry. And I said, oh, care ministry, what is that? Tell me how that works. He said, well, we have this whole team of people, and they do weekly visits, and they send meals, and they write cards, and they make phone calls, and they care for our church community on a weekly basis. And it's all organized, and it's organized into teams. And this beautiful woman named Julie Hume took, takes care of it, and our church knows that they are cared for and loved by their church because of the care ministry. And so one of the first things I ever heard about this church was this incredible care ministry that still continues today. Randy King has taken it over and does a fantastic job with it. And it really is what we hear as pastors when somebody goes down with a broken ankle or pneumonia and they come back into our community, what we hear is, I couldn't believe the caring of the church. I got so many cards and emails and, and, and meals and things. And that's how we show the love. Of God and that's the story and the lesson that comes from this scripture that Jesus does command us to take care of one another after I'd been here for a while and when Alan arrived we both had come from churches that had something called Stephen ministry and we didn't have it at this church yet and I saw that as the next logical extension of our care ministry that in addition to this wonderful weekly response we needed folks who could come alongside one-on-one -on -one with someone and give them really individualized care, that, that great gift and ministry of listening. Because sometimes when we get in a pickle, all we need is somebody to listen to us and pray with us and to just kind of be there as a support. So we started Stephen Ministry, and we grew Stephen Ministry, and I am so excited to let you know that tomorrow night, in addition to our 11 already commissioned Stephen Ministers, we're adding five new ones, and I hope you'll come tomorrow at 7 for our Stephen Ministry Commissioning. These folks have been through 50 hours of training, 50 hours of training in order to prepare to be a caregiver to someone in the congregation. They're living out the life of this scripture where Jesus calls the faith community to care for one another, and I hope you'll be there to celebrate their commissioning. They have put in, I can't even tell you how many hours of caring, and when we have commissioned Stephen Ministers who can pick up that load, it takes the load off the, the clergy staff. It enables us to do the things that clergy are called to do. And it's a wonderful thing in how the body of Christ uses its gifts to come together. So my last question for you this day is this. Where is Jesus calling you into taking responsibility of care and responsibility for the sake of his kingdom? Jesus looked at John as a representative of his faith community, and he said, you take care of my mama. Jesus looks at you today and says, you take care of all my mamas and my daddies and my baby boys and my baby girls. It is our job to care for one another. And I ask you now, where is God calling you to care for someone in this congregation? I want to lay that on your heart as we open up the altar during our final hymn. We just heard the choir sing this beautiful anthem, and that's going to serve as our final hymn. We'll have a chance to sing that. But I know some of you right now are, are thinking about one particular person in this congregation who needs a care touch. Uh, maybe you're thinking about your own mother. 
and it's time to go home and give her a phone call. If your mother's alive on earth, go home and give her a phone call. I can't do that. So do that if you have your mama alive on earth. Maybe Jesus is calling you into something very particular, like to get on the care ministry team. Maybe he's calling you into Stephen ministry because you have that gift of mercy or healing. But I know that Jesus is calling all of us to kind of step up our game and to do what he asked John to do and to be a caregiver to someone in this congregation. Our uh, music is not in your hymnals, but we do have it on the screen. So let us stand now and sing together the power of the cross. The altar is open for you to come and converse with your Lord. Go now with the love of God surrounding you, the anointing and transformation of the Son, yours to claim, and yours to give away, and may the Holy Spirit empower you to make this a Lenten season you will never forget. Amen? Amen.